Hi, my name is Orwan Eravia. I'm the artistic director of ITFA. Welcome to this, hopefully, uh, intense okay. session. It's a subject that started uh, to, to you know, became a necessary subject to discuss in this year's ITFA due to a project that became a reality, will be there tomorrow for you, uh, which is the uh, revival of the long lost film, first film of Ziga Vertov, our godfather. And uh, this was initiated by one of our uh, dear guests of this panel, we have still uh, one guest on the way. She will arrive, I am very sure, but we're introducing the others while she does. So we have our dear Nikolai Izvolov here with us. Thank you for joining us, Nikolai. Thank you. Thank you for and thank you, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity of celebrating your hard work towards this release, re-release of a great, great part of our history. Um, we're happy to have you, and thank you very much, Giovanna Fossati from I Film Institute, Film Museum, to join us and to share your massive expertise. Uh, you know, the, the I Film Institute is, uh, is that very beautiful building we all know. <laughs> and there we have one of the worlds, I would say, but... Uh, I tend to, I, to not to know the comparative uh, uh, reality, but I am very sure that an over 50,000 titles archive, uh, uh, it's the history of world cinema, the history of Dutch cinema, is taken care of in I uh, Museum, and the collection is vast and is being digitized continuously. The Institute takes care of the, uh, uh, of its archives and tries to make our heritage future proof. It's a huge project that we, uh, we are honored to partner with. It's a huge effort that we need, that we rely upon, and that we, uh, yeah, we just need this partnership. And this leads me to welcoming our moderator. Thank you, Sonia, very much for moderating this and to inviting the Director of I Film Museum, Sandra Den Hamen. Thank you. Uh, Can you give a hand yeah. to Sandra? Uh, thank you, Aura. Thank you very much. I will be short because I almost lost my voice. But first of all, I would like to start with uh, paying tribute to you, to ITVA, because I think if I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in I, at I, but also of the Dutch film industry and the people of Amsterdam, living in Amsterdam, that we are so happy with ITVA and so happy to have you with us. So please give him a hand as well. <laughs> um, and indeed, we are extremely honored with this renewed partnership because ITVA and I have a partnership that goes long back. Actually, you are in the 31st year. I think I was there every year, so I go long way back too. Um, but we work together on lots of uh, uh, fields. We work together in the international promotion of Dutch films, Dutch documentaries. We were here on Saturday hosting a party. Uh, Parties are nice, but presenting the f Dutch films abroad uh, is also very important. We work together very much on the field of film education. Uh, ITVA and I are partnering over the years already within the festival, but also outside. So for us, this is an honor that we can celebrate uh, an extra uh, uh, level in our partnership is that we will work on, in the field which is our core business, preservation and restoration of the moving image. And you were uh, talking about the memory of, uh, that we are preserving indeed with 50,000 uh, films in our archive, but you write history every year and rewrite history. And we think it's very important to safeguard that history because in the Netherlands we are lucky, we, we are lucky with I, we have that beautiful building, but we also have a beautiful collection center where we digitize our films, restore our films, but we know that in many countries that is not the case. So I think apart from 
uh, restoring a film every year uh, and working with that together. I hope we can also work together with many international colleagues and the colleagues of uh, Sound and Vision in Hilversum to take care of cinematic heritage of ITVA and the documentary film in general. So I hope this is a first start to a beautiful future of the past as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a promising uh, 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 project by every means. Uh, we will leave you uh, the stage. I'll just say that the question who decides is a very good question for a panel. I really enjoy the challenge and I hope that, uh, that, uh, that our third uh, participant, Joana, hi, Joana Suarez is here. Joana is from the New York Film, uh, New York uh, University. Uh, pleasure to have you here. And have a good session, everyone. We'll be listening. Is it Juana or Juana? Juana. 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 I think the mic is working, yes. Welcome to everyone um, in this room. Uh, to this uh, first uh, or this talk of what um, is supposed to be the start of a series, um, recurring series every year at ITFA about um, heritage, film heritage. And I think it's a very important decision to do that because heritage uh, not only seems but has been, uh, has becoming, has been becoming very, very um, urgent, um, interesting, especially um, now digitization has reached certain stages and more people have access to heritage or are able to access heritage and reflect upon it. But first, um, again, back to our, our panel. I'm very happy uh, to have you, uh, to have the three of you here because I think all three, each of you um, represents um, a corner of the world where the state, is, the state of the art in, in, in digitization, preservation, and dealing with heritage may be um, very uh, different for, for reasons uh, that, that are probably very interesting to talk about. Mm -hmm. But also, I think each of you has experience in, of course, working in the archive um, and reflecting about what you found there. Um, either um, as a historian or a researcher or um, a, a theorist. And also some of you have been uh, uh, curating archival material. So I think it's a fantastic um, panel and a fantastic combination of expertise and, and knowledge that you bring to this, to this panel. So the question, who decides? As Orva said, it's a very challenging question. But the... Um, the main topic that is behind this question um, is the politics of um, the politics of selection, and I think that's very important phrasing because when you talk about the politics of selection, it involves a power, it, which is not just power, but it's power maybe of the curator, but maybe also power in terms of. Um, shortage of storage uh, space, of financial uh, um, restrictions, etc., etc., and also um, it involves thinking about uh, the kind of heritage that we are trying to preserve and present to an audience, because that indeed marks how we see our own film history, um, and that again, also requires some reflection, because we may exclude, and on the other hand, include certain um, visions on heritage and on the past and on history um, in general. So, let's start, and of course there will be some uh, space for you in the audience to uh, ask questions. We'll see how that goes, but first I would like to, you, of course, to, to talk. Um, so, let's start with the first questions. How uh, does your film archive make a selection? And I know, uh, Juana, you haven't, you, you're not working in an, um, in an archive yourself because uh, you're working at the university, but you have a, um, a, a combined expertise on Latin American study and study in preservation. So 
from your knowledge on Latin American film archives, what can you say about how they make their selections um, uh, to preserve for the future and what in general criteria are, if there are general criteria, because Latin America is also vast uh, space with very different uh, cultures in itself. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, number one, apologies for being late. Um, they couldn't find you were my in name, time. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a mess. Uh, number two, um, thank you so much for the invitation. And yes, I do not work for a film archive, but I work for a, for, for a lot of film archives, uh, namely because I've been doing a digital humanities project, mm -hmm. a collaboration project that is called Arturita. And I have some images that if there is time, we might be able to... Uh, show at the end, but if you're gonna go in order per the questions, um, there is one thing that I want to say at the very, very beginning. I am finding very difficult to talk about archives in Latin America because we are really, we do a lot of things with Portugal and Spain because of a colonial history mm -hmm. and also because there is a lot of uh, historical col collaboration in film institutions. So we really, we're really talking about 23 countries, 21 countries in Latin America, a uh, country that has a very, country like Puerto Rico that is in, in, in a very dire need of support right now after Hurricane Maria, uh, is also part of the states. So, and I'm finding a little bit difficult to talk these days a little bit up about archives without thinking, number one, at what happened at the Brazilian Museum. Uh, in September the 2nd. It's not only because it, 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 it is a museum, a memory institution, yes. but because when we talk about film and digitization, we try to pay a lot of attention to the films per se, and we tend to forget all the paracinematics that is around that, that we're not only digitizing film, but we also have posters, lobby cards, storyboards, scripts, books, a lot of materials. And also because there is a lot of faith in the digital and in Latin American archives, it's very difficult to keep making that distinction between analog archives and digital archives. I'm citing a little bit more to Melissa Prelinger and Rick Prelinger. Rick is the one that is always mentioned, but Melissa does a lot of work in that archive mm -hmm. um, to stop the divide between the analog and the digital because our decisions in archives in Latin America, and I am far for rep from representing any archive, mm -hmm. um, are made in the, um, are ma are, have to be made in the two in the two things, both analog and digital. For for this ITFA, I send a survey to close friends, not to the main archives. When I talk about Latin American archives, I like to make a division between Cinematheques and Filmotheques and National Archives, Filmoteca UNAM, Cinemateca UNAM, Cinemateca de Uruguay, Museo del Cine, because I think that those are the visible ones and they are historically important and very invested in the construction of nationhood, Mexicanness, Brazilianness, uh, Argentinidad, etc. But in Latin America, there is a big bulk of minor archives that deserve attention. Centros de la Memoria, uh, collections that are at universities, uh, in general institutions that do not, that have an, a mission statement and the archive does not have a mission statement per se. Uh, Centros de la Memoria are particular, particularly important because a lot of historical material for us, mainly related to dictatorships and regimes of terror, mm -hmm. go there. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, there is like an emergence right now of community archiving that is very important for countries that have been at war and how communities represent themselves and what they care for preserving. And also there is an emergence of queer archives, which is very recent in Latin America and in many parts of the world. So I think that when we talk about who makes the decision, we're talking about these institutions mm -hmm. that are often represented at the FIAF now. The FIAF has a subsidiary in Latin America, yeah, which is the, have to explain what it is the International audience. Federation of Film Archives. Mm -hmm. And they have a section in Latin America that is called CLIM, which is like Council of Latin American Archives. They are having a meeting in December. I look at the program. Oh, it's, it's a little bit like a cine club. They are showing what they are preserving. They are not having this kind of conversation. They are not having a conversation on priorities. And they are not having some, a, a conversation that I think is very important in Latin America. Training, training of human resources, minding the gap, 
There's a lot of old people that know a lot of stuff, and we need to bring that knowledge to the table. And also, in institutions, in associations, Latin American countries have to be moved from the line representing diversity and international outreach. We need to be present in uh, conversations about technology mm -hmm. uh, and really who makes the decisions. We are very grateful for everything that the Film Foundation does in Latin America, but I think that's also a token of who is curating Latin American memory. Now, uh, so I could name and name and name collections, uh, but I think that the decision is made in a very vertical way. Yes. Um, and so I think that that's very debatable. For me, the problem is who is reaching out to all those minor archives. Yes, I, I understand. Okay, you're addressing uh, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of issues. Uh, even, I think, one that I discussed with Tijuana would be a wonderful topic for next year, <laughs> namely participatory or community archives. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Nikolai, um, you are here for a special reason, of course, uh, because you're bringing a, a, a new version of Wertov in collaboration with uh, I Film Museum, but you have a lot of experience when it comes to um, selection in the Moscow Film Archive, being a researcher and also um, an, um, a film historian and maybe a curator. So, uh, how would you, uh, how would you, s ha what, what's your opinion on the state of the art at the Moscow um, Film Archive when it comes to um, selections and the um, um, and how they how they make how you make your selection. Or maybe you, you're not the only one who is in charge. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a very important question for our today's discussion. Is it okay with the microphone? Yes, I think so. Can you hear um, Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I came from uh, Russia, and Russia has a very long uh, history as a uh, Soviet Union. It was a uh, state where only government, government uh, uh, could make a decision and there was special laws which um, controlled the way how films were produced and preserved. Uh, only one producer was in the Soviet Union, it was the state. Mm -hmm. So all the archives which exist in modern Russia are former Soviet archives, and all of them were organized with, uh, according with the laws um, of the Soviet, Soviet government. Uh, that's why there was a spe very special law of the, um, the special example for each film, which was necessary to put to the state film archive. That's why, uh, for example, the uh, film history and uh, the history of the country before the October Revolution of 1917 was presented much uh, worse than the history of the Soviet period. Because when you have a law and all the filmmakers have to follow the law, the film collection uh, preserves very good because they have very special regulations how film is uh, producing, uh, produced, how the film is going to archive, and they have a very special regulations inside the archive how to preserve and how to control the quality of uh, um, preservation, um, how to um, study the profession of archivists. So they have very special uh, educational institutions for those people who are responsible for the preservation uh, and so on. I think, uh, and it's my opinion, that only when state in general controls the system of preservation, the film, films can be preserved uh, in a good condition. Uh, I know, for example, the, the, um, one more example, when the Soviet Union crashed and uh, modern Russia uh, leaves according to different laws, so the law which controls the special um, copy of the film must be put to uh, film archive was cancelled. And it means that uh, Russian cinema produced in the 90s preserved much, much worse than the uh, films preserved in the 80s. Yeah, so yeah. it's our modern history. And uh, 10 or 15 years passed when the modern government decided to repeat the law. And now all the films produced with the uh, state money must be put to state film archives. But we have a lot of uh, private studios, and what to do with them? Because uh, there must be, and there, of course, are very good films, which is also a part of our visual memory. Mm -hmm. It's a very serious question, because if the state uh, gives money to a uh, filmmaker, it, they have a right to get a copy of the film. Yes. 
Yeah. But if it is private producer, he, it, he will decide whether his film will be preserved or not. Mm -hmm. So but again, why, why was it that in the 80s there were more films preserved than in the 90s, so after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the communist Yeah, yeah that's true, collapse. that's true. That's true. The uh, films of uh, 90s were preserved in, in, in not such a good condition as the film of 80s. They were, but not in, not in a good condition. Yeah, and only uh, maybe 15 years ago, a uh, new government of Russia also again repeated the law of a special yeah. copy of the film must be put to state film archives. Yeah. Because when films were a part of the whole propaganda or the whole communist system, you mean the state took more responsibility yes. for its own heritage. And I'm sure that all the country uh, which have a great national cinematography must be uh, aware of such a, such a situation. They have to um, invent such a law as it is in the United States, as, as I know, because uh, American film producers uh, think that it's their honor to put their film to the state film uh, treasury. So, so they, have, they can uh, decide themselves yes. whether they put it or not. But it's much better to preserve film, to put it in the state uh, film treasury in special conditions with especially trained people who are responsible mm -hmm. for the preservation. Okay, uh, Giovanna, we don't, in the Netherlands we don't have this... Uh, um, colonial heritage. Yeah, we have it, but from, <laughs> from the other from the other side of the of, of the coin, and uh, we don't have this uh, state-controlled um, um, uh, heritage. But so we are in a luxury, more or less luxury. Uh, um, I have to use the mic better. <laughs> uh, we are in a luxury position, uh, so it seems. Um, so who decides then in such a luxury, when it's, it's such a luxury position and such a luxury situation? Yeah, no, indeed, uh, um, the Netherlands and, and I would say in general Northern Europe is quite an exception worldwide in terms of uh, uh, um, funding, uh, state funding for mm -hmm. archives, um, mm -hmm. um, which... Uh, um, makes it um, a, a very um, uh, interesting to spot to be in these days. Uh, um, um, I think maybe before I zoom in, in the, uh, on the Dutch situation, something I'd like to say in general about uh, how things are changing in terms of film heritage uh, mm -hmm. these days, uh, and I think are changing for the, for the better, mm -hmm. uh, definitely the fact that we are here talking about it, it's yes. a great sign, mm -hmm. and in general, that uh, um, uh, many festivals uh, are uh, uh, focusing on heritage, and now we'll talk later about what this heritage is uh, and who decides what to show on festivals, but in general it's a big change and uh, allows us to, to discuss uh, about the problem, um, because it is a problem, even in uh, rich northern Europe where there is a good funding for film preservation, uh, um, um, and let's take I 50,000 titles in the collection, that's a medium size uh, collection, uh, about uh, 10,000 have been digitized, um, and let's say that uh, uh, restored and digitized. The rest is well kept, which is already a luxury because many archives, uh, even state archives, uh, but definitely the small archives cannot even uh, uh, um, have uh, the um, n necessary uh, uh, preservation standards. And for analog films, we are talking about low temperatures and low relative humidities. For uh, digital films, uh, and we are already, we we are already 10 years that we are producing worldwide digital, uh, 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 born digital content films. Uh, you need a lot of investment in constant uh, uh, preservation of the data, constant migration. So, back uh, uh, to the to the um, uh, good changes, a lot of attention at festivals, discussion like this one, but also uh, um, because of uh, uh, digital accessibility, there is a much more interest um, in heritage, in general, not only film, but film as well. 
Um, so uh, um, I think what comes with it is that uh, um, states, uh, um, archives uh, uh, that have a tradition of investing in preservation and restoration also have a, 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 a um, um, feel and rightly so, I think, the pressure to explain their, their choices, more and more. Um, um, where do you see that happen in the Netherlands? Where do, when or where? Where, where do you see Is well, it happening and where do you see it? Well, happening? I see it happening uh, in, in, from my personal experience on two levels. Uh, mm -hmm. When I'm uh, as, a, as a scholar, when I teach, mm -hmm. um, I hear this question uh, from the students. I've been teaching uh, 15 years and uh, recently that's uh, a constant question. And I'm very happy. It's an important question. So it's a big discussion mm -hmm. uh, with students. And within the archive, I feel it uh, um, in my daily work. I mean, I've always been uh, one great... By the way, I'm from Italy originally. I've been working here 22 years, so my, all my professional life. And, but I know a little bit of how things work in Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, often different than here. Uh, one great thing about... Um, uh, in my experience of working in, in Dutch institutions is that there is a much more uh, um, horizontal uh, uh, mm -hmm. decision process, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that uh, someone has to take a decision because yes. it has, mm -hmm. uh, and the decision are not even taken the moment you choose what to preserve, but the moment when you choose what enters the archive, and it's really, a, uh, not even a, a singular person. Uh, the Netherlands Film Museum, now I Film Museum, uh, is 72 years old. And so it's 72 years of decisions. So it's also very difficult as an individual. You are part of that decision power, mm -hmm. but you are not... Uh, in a position where you can make big changes. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think the Netherlands has a much more uh, horizontal approach to this kind of decision, and definitely in the past 10 years, and I think it's uh, uh, a consequence of a different culture with uh, uh, mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. access, uh, more participatory uh, uh, approach to uh, uh, heritage and research in general. Um, there is much much more um, um, it, it, the, the need to be transparent about the choices is felt much more. I feel it, and I, I see my colleagues are feeling it. So I think that's another uh, change for the better. And I, I cannot speak for worldwide, but I think uh, um, mm -hmm. this is a trend going in that But is direction. it an internal discussion? Is transparency, is it an, um, internally discussed? the criteria be uh, behind the selection? Well, or is, um, it, is it, it something that just, you know, is a general practice, daily practice, and then at a certain point, uh, you reflect upon it's it. It's both. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, criteria, um, we uh, renew our collection policy every four years. So it's something that you can really see yeah. uh, in the last couple of collection policies that the criteria are, make, are mm -hmm. being made more and more transparent. Uh, and uh, um, But it's something that uh, uh, it's also felt. In the, I think, in the daily practice, in that sense, you discuss with colleagues. Yeah, discuss and with colleagues from the field. Yeah. So I'm not talking about col among a team of curators with, uh, within mm -hmm. the archive, mm -hmm. but a constant uh, um, uh, discussion with the field, mm -hmm. which is, of course, again, a field of selected researchers. Uh, uh, but still, it is an open. And the discussion. field means people, um, historians, film historians, would like to work with the material right. and reflect upon it and write about exactly. it. Yes. yes. You're one such film historian that also writes about um, your, your business, so to speak, your, um, what you're doing in the, in the archive. So um, when you listen to Giovanna, how is that in, 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 in a Russian s situation? Do you um, have some transparency about the criteria that are being used by the archive. With whom are you discussing? How are you reaching out to your uh, colleague or colleague film historians, etc.? Could you talk us, tell us a little bit about that? Um, thank you again. Thank you for the question. It's a very, very important thing. And uh, I, I remember and I recall 
one motto which was uh, at the uh, Akaya Film Festival of Gospel Mafond near Moscow. It was in the uh, very special place which is called Bielas Talbi. And there is such a motto of the festival. All the films were born free and equal. So they mm -hmm. preserve all the films ever produced, all the films. I see. Yeah. They they never divide films to good films and bad ones mm -hmm. because we never know what will be in the future, which films mm -hmm. will remain in history, uh, which films will be lost, so-called lost, which one will be uh, experience a revival. So if we never can foresee what will happen. So we preserve everything. That is our strong position that we have to preserve preserve all the films which uh, came to the uh, state archives. And I think it's a very good position, because we, uh, if, if we film historians will decide which film uh, can be preserved and which cannot, so we will uh, make our collections much uh, smaller and much uh, less important, yes. because uh, it's, uh, if we decide with a child we never know how it will grow. Will be clever or stupid. Will mm -hmm. be a scientist or mm -hmm. a factory worker. We never know. So we never know the future uh, biography of each film. So yeah. we have to preserve everything. That, that, that's a very um, that's a very um, um, special um, approach, I would say. And I um, I know uh, with all the luxury in the Netherlands that we're talking about, we are not able to do that. Um, so yeah, we have to make selections, and of course, you always make make a selection from the point of view of the present about what you think would be interesting for the future, and that that's a difficult uh, that's a difficult area, of course, where you need where you need indeed reflection and, and transparency, because how can we decide indeed about what would be important for the uh, for the future? Um, so uh, yeah, that, uh, I didn't know that, and I. I assume it's not like that in Latin American archives. So I wonder how you're struggling with uh, all these different um, factors that are impacting on the selection process, as you mentioned before, the, the colonial um, history and the fact that maybe uh, material that you would like to have in Latin America is somewhere else, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think in the case of documentary, an issue is that um, there has been more emphasis and more attention in saving um, fiction, long features, short features, historically. So for some reason, although documentary is so important in Latin America, and one of the most important periods, of course, is the so-called new Latin American cinema, all yeah. the cinema that emerged around the utopia and the promise of the Cuban revolution that mm -hmm. has names like mm -hmm. Gutierrez Alea, Julio Espinosa, Fernando Virri, mm -hmm. Solanas, um, is really important. Again, we go back to the issue of resources. So I agree with you on the mm -hmm. issue of film historians, but most people, I sent a little survey to colleagues, think that documentaries get to be preserved on the basis of demand from students, for example, or researchers that say, this is something that I would like to study. Yes. But we have a big problem, and it's one of the images that I have um, that I don't know if we will have time to show. We only have, we only have in Latin America at this moment scanners. Uh, the only scanner that is working is the, the scanner of the Ecuador Cinematec that has very little use, mm -hmm. and the scanner of the Cinemateca uh, in Mexico, of the Cineteca Nacional. Mm -hmm. um, and then... In the one in Cineteca de Chile, the Cineteca in Brasil is not working. So we have to outsource digitization and restoration, digital restoration services to labs that are extremely expensive. Yes, you don't so, have it in, in your institution. Exactly. So yes. in light of that, a lot of people, what they are doing, I mean, people like Diego Garcia Moreno, Marta Rodriguez, in the mm -hmm. case of Colombia, Luis Ospina, they are taking care of their own preservation projects. They are finding the funding, they are doing very precarious digitizations, mm -hmm. in many cases still telecines, because they, can, they cannot afford 2Ks or 4Ks. Um, I think that places like Filmoteca UNAM has done a very good job in uh, looking at Mexican documentary, but we really have we can just not look at the documentary from the last 40 or 50 years. Every single nitrate 
in Latin America that has been digitized and a lot of history of newsreels mm -hmm. and um, of um, uh, dailies and everything is in nitrates. Most nitrates are needing a very good 2K or 4K restoration. And then a lot of documentaries that were made for television that are very important are in magnetic media support. And Latin America still needs a lot of training. I think the world all over the place still needs a lot of training on magnetic media digitization and preservation. Uh, and also those are collections that are very fragile, um, mm -hmm. that had been erased, that are incomplete, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a big part of the discussion is never separated from the issue of resources and the technology that is available. Of course. In of the course. case of Colombia, I have been working for five years now in the restoration of an ethnographical series of documentaries that were made in the 80s. Mm -hmm. They were made in 16, transferred to UMATIC for TV broadcasting, Europari, that are very important. I presented that in Amsterdam here at, um, I don't know, AMIA perhaps, five years ago. But it's 64 documentaries. And in addition to those documentaries, you have 64 or something else, 64 or something else. So it's a massive amount of material to restore mm -hmm. that is very expensive when you don't have a scanner and when there are not multiple uh, magnetic media units in the country. Yes. Also because everything tends to be centralized in the capital cities. Mm -hmm. We don't have a culture where preservation also goes to regional places. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, that yes. decentering is very important for sustainability. Yeah, I understand. Um, maybe you want to, yes, please, yeah, yeah, if you um, would like to. No, because maybe I'm thinking maybe it's uh, um, good to um, um, spell out a couple of things about uh, what is film preservation, restoration, and digitization. Because um, there are, um, um, when we say preserving everything at best po in the best possible condition, it means really keeping material uh, in a vault when it's under analog for the longest term, but it doesn't mean to make it accessible. So uh, even the rich archives who can uh, uh, be uh, as uh, generous as possible in terms of what to preserve, uh, still they don't have necessarily the means uh, to uh, uh, restore and digitize everything they hold in the archives. Um, when we are talking about restoration, usually uh, we are talking about uh, investing quite a lot of money to really uh, look at the material, preserve it as closely as possible to its original form, if it's uh, on celluloid, possibly even if it's a digital restoration, go back to celluloid and show it as such. When we talk about digitization, we can talk about a lower quality digitization to make material accessible for research or for whatever ends. But even that uh, costs a lot of uh, uh, time and money because you have to sort out the material, prepare it, uh, have a scanner yeah. that's working uh, uh, to do it. So um, now I think it's important also to uh, point out that nowadays, exactly for that same reason of uh, uh, growing interest, there is no such a thing as a restoration without a presentation. So. Uh, uh, when we are working towards uh, preserving and restoring, we always think in terms of making a, a, a material accessible. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think it's important also to realize that there is a double agenda within uh, archives. One is that of uh, claiming film as we've done for the past uh, 70 years and more, um, definitely since the uh, big uh, uh, national archives were founded in the 20s, that film is an art, so we need the money to restore it and we need to preserve it as an art object. So that's a very important um, 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 a, yeah, a p political agenda the, to make sure that we get the resources to run the institutes to preserve and restore the material. But there is another agenda which is kind of in contradiction to it, but 
e even um, uh, probably as important, if not more, that uh, 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 we also need to digitize as much as possible, because otherwise this uh, material will disappear. And in that sense, uh, um, um, I'd like to just name um, uh, uh, Caroline Frick and her uh, book uh, Saving Cinema uh, from 2011, and that was a very important statement she made, uh, her, the, the, the subtitle of her book, book is uh, Politics of Preservation, uh, about uh, um, digitization as a form of preservation. And it's something uh, very important because uh, it makes uh, it possible to uh, uh, um, um, I think that there are uh, there are collections that will never get the funding that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 big feature films of well-known documentaries will get. There are just collections that will disappear if if they are not digitized and made available. So uh, we have to be objective, but uh, about that and practical. On the other hand, it is a very difficult agenda because uh, uh, f with some people you have to keep aiming at the big restoration standard because you need the funding for that. In general, you need the funding for, but on the other hand, it's also important to uh, um, be very, very uh, practical and objective. If there is any hope for uh, 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 saving uh, heritage in a very um, broadest sense of the word, uh, then it's only uh, uh, through uh, a much um, lower uh, uh, level of uh, uh, digitization and access. Yeah, do you agree, uh, Nikolai? I, I thought you were you were thinking about it, and I saw you doing like this. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, I agree, but uh, I think that the problem of digitalization is much much wider. And there are a lot of uh, inner problems in this, pro uh, in this process. Uh, when we make our collections accessible, mm -hmm. we cannot preserve them in their real condition. It's a kind of paradox, you know, because... Why, why is Because that? when the films exist, you know, uh, there are two different uh, area of um, activity. One is preservation, another is uh, digitalization and accessibility. Uh, for example, we all know such resources like YouTube. Mm -hmm. When uh, all the people put the copies of films they have in their possession into the internet. But usually these are uh, copies of a very bad, a very poor quality. Often people use copies made from the digitalized VHS prints, VHS tapes. And when we try later to uh, collect money for preservation of some film, uh, there was some psychological problems because people who are responsible for money say, why should we spend money for the film? It's wide known. Everyone knows it. And psychology is a very important uh, point in this uh, process because uh, psychologically we uh, always keep in mind, is it necessary to put money in this project or not? Mm -hmm. And in our, in our country, in Russia, we have uh, state film archives. So it's a little bit different because the because, uh, state put money into the preservation for the digitalization, for the uh, establishing standards and so on. Uh, but even in this case, uh, films which are uh, accessible is very difficult to preserve. You know, it, it's, it will be always happen. If you want to preserve something, never make it accessible. I don't understand. <laughs> really. Do you agree with because me or not? Because it's totally contrary on t to what you are saying. Um, uh, or not? No, I, I think I understand, and it's about this double agenda. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. If you need yeah. uh, a funding to uh, yeah. uh, run an archive and also have the possibility to invest in uh, a big restoration, uh, um, you'll have... Uh, <laughs> An example, a couple of years ago, one very important Dutch title uh, uh, um, uh, was in, in badly need of restoration. The, 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 the material that was uh, being held was all uh, 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 deteriorating, uh, color fading, uh, etc. cetera. Um, when we were making the case for funding this restoration uh, on TV, that same title was broadcasted and uh, uh, we 
uh, heard why do we need to restore that title because it's, uh, it was yesterday on TV. So in that sense, uh, if you want to restore your cinematographic heritage and at least a representative quantity of that at uh, uh, cinema quality when you can screen it on the, on, on the screen and not only watch it on, 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 a, on a TV monitor, then it works very much against you if your funding entities will say, it's on YouTube, why do you need to restore it on 70 millimeter? Then you have to explain, well, if I project a, a YouTube video on a 70 millimeter screen, then you only see pixels. Uh, so it's a bit, but on the other hand, uh, again, what, what I'm arguing, and I think we will agree on that, is that not all collections will be restored on 70 millimeter. It's not possible financially and probably not even needed. Um, but then, of course, uh, we come to the discussion about uh, how, who decides where to invest money. Because indeed, uh, at the end of the day, if you invest uh, 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 100,000 euros in restoring one titles because it will be screened in Cannes, uh, you are not using that 100,000 euros to uh, digitize maybe uh, 100,000 <laughs> uh, uh, other films. Then what I say, and I'll pass the mic, uh, about reactions on this is that one screening in Cannes, it's very useful for us to make the case for getting more money to do other stuff. Um, it's a bit of a, a, a balance between the two. At this point, exposure, especially for funding aid entities, it's an important measure mm -hmm. to find money. I want to add something that is very important because I said at the beginning that I think that there is a lot of faith in the digital. And the issue is that people get surprised that films that are only 30 or 40 years old are being already preserved or transferred to digital and restored digitally. But I think, and, and this is, I think this is true, and um, there are exceptions. I don't want to make a generalization, but for a lot of young filmmakers that I know that had only work on digital, they are not aware that their films also have to be preserved. And when I was talking about cost and the divide between the analog and the digital, is that a very important concept of digitization is usually neglected, and is the issue of digital preservation and how expensive it is. You create your film in digital, or, or you digitize your element. Keeping those digital assets is extremely expensive. Um, and it's also an environmental issue. If we go back to thinking about the archive in the Anthropocene. Um, and so that goes into the budget of countries that cannot afford these processes. One uh, storage system from Amazon for many archives in Latin America is simply unattainable. It's impossible, it's out of the question. What you will have to pay if you have digitized, let's say, I think in Colombia, we're doing good. I'm, I'm Colombian. Um, I live in New York, but I, I work closely with the archives in Colombia, not necessarily with Patrimonio. But we have done like 16 films in the last two years in preservation. Mm -hmm. Keeping those digital assets is extremely impossible, and we're depending on technology. We're not, DCPs are not storage devices. Those are access um, devices. You have to store in LTOs, in L and LTOs only read two generations back. That, in combination with the fact that most national archives in Latin America are extremely bureaucratic. And I will say that the, bureau the bureaucracy is more dangerous than the deterioration of the material per se. Because when you um, advocate to buy LTO aids, by the time the ama amazing amount of paperwork, signatures, and seals, and paper. We still love paper. That's a colonial heritage that we love and we cannot detach from. By the time that, that's, that we are, are able to comply with LTO 8, that the paperwork is ready, LTO is probably in LTO 12. And they tell you, oh no, you have to start over. Yeah, because it says here LTA 8. So you just cannot simply change the number. So that's a real issue, the cost of all of this, the, 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 the cost of digital preservation. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's also, you get 
uh, request from people that are not into filmmaking and they tell you, but why they don't digitize all of that and just put it on YouTube? They are not thinking about cost. Mm -hmm. They are not thinking about the aesthetical characteristics of the product, mm -hmm. how much you are violating the moral right of the filmmaker yeah. when you hyper compress something and put it in YouTube. And they, they are also not understanding that we are digitizing materials we document in a very different way these days. Mm -hmm. We're very careful about copyright, but we also have to deal with material from the 50s and the 60s that do not have copyright. And when we are going to apply for international grants, that's probably the first thing that we see in digitization processes. Have you clear copyright for these um, elements? And sometimes you're battling with families, estate, widows, um, Sons that think that because you're going to digitize the material, you're going to be rich with that, with that material again. So I think it's, there are like many things related to how a collection works that people do not know. Mm -hmm. It's not just having the film and put it in, in the scanner. It's embedded into a whole infrastructure that is very complicated, that is very bureaucratic, that requires film historians, people that have worked in the archives and can trace back the materials, but mainly... It really demands for archives to be able to go at a faster pace. And for me, I think it's important that archives in regions like the one that I work with start thinking about sustainability. Mm -hmm. For example, the cinematics that do have scanners, they should be able to be doing our work so that we are not sending that to very expensive labs here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying for free, but the money that we are paying to the European labs or to the American labs is probably money that the Cinemateca in Mexico, the Cineteca Nacional, should be using now. Uh, and it, that's a way to make the archive sustainable. Yes. Uh, Nikolai, I, um, I, um, once more back to this uh, to the statement that you made before, and that both you, Giovanna, and, and uh, uh, Juana uh, responded to. Um, it has to do something with how do you view film as an art form? Um, or if you want to, you, you know, if you if you if you see this this um, discrepancy between uh, digitization, preservation, and making things accessible for the audience, has to do with how do you see film, how it should be presented in its original form, or as close to its original form, or not, or doesn't it have anything to do with that? Well, uh, of course, I think that film must be presented in its original form, but how to do it? Yeah, especially, exactly. Especially Is with films which were made 100 years ago, which were shot in, in black and white, um, which were uh, projected with a um, different speed, which had a very special uh, musical um, accompaniment and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, of course, now when uh, digital technologies came, we uh, have a really new industry of old cinema because it, yeah. it's uh, easily accessible for the university schools. People studied to, uh, to study it, and of course they had uh, a new uh, possibilities to see and compare old and new films, which was earlier not impossible. Uh, you could only uh, it was not possible because you could only see films see films in the theaters of the old cinema or yeah. film museums. Yes. Now, all the films on, are accessible on DVD, on different... Uh, sort of context changes and so anyway. On. But the yeah. question is, do we see the films in its original form? Because they were produced for the big screen, yeah. for, the, for the very special yeah. um, musical orchestra, and so on. And when now my students see films on the iPhone screen, I cannot explain them. It's absolutely different impression. Yeah. Because film made for the big screen has absolutely different dynamics of yes. the moving inside. Uh, but format, they don't want to see it. Yes. Oh, uh, Eisenstein, Battleship, uh, 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 I've seen it. Mm -hmm. So five minutes, and they are completely uh, <laughs> study Battleship, uh, you know, yes. and they don't want to go to the cinema to see it on a big screen. Yeah, so how, how would you like to deal with that? Destroy all I found. <laughs> 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 I think it's impossible. And uh, of course, it's very good that uh, uh, such festival like IFA exists, and we can see new and old films on the big screen with uh, uh, live music and so on. But I'm not sure that it is uh, necessary for all the people who use uh, audiovisual products, like uh, for the TV spectators and so on. Uh, I think that uh, cinema and big screens. Uh, uh, transformed into some uh, artifacts of the uh, past time, like 
uh, Egyptian pyramids, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's, it's good that we have now a new architecture, new buildings, much more comfortable and easy and cheaper than uh, these Egyptians' uh, great cathedrals or pyramids. But it, it's a usual process, a process of the evolution. And of course, the uh, cinematographic technical will be changed. And uh, cinematographic experience of the people will be changed. Everything will be changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very big question, question you ask me. What is the original form of the film? Is it necessary to see or not? I think that it is uh, necessary to, to see in its original form, but I'm, I'm not sure that it is possible. Giovanna would like to no, respond? Maybe, maybe just on, a, on an uh, upbeat note, I think uh, uh, today we have many more chances than we used only uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago to see some of these films in their original form. Um, uh, I studied in the early 90s and uh, I, I, I used to see all the, all the classics on VHS, which is even worse, if you wish, than, than YouTube. So, so uh, today, because we have uh, uh, um, um, festivals and archives uh, that are uh, um, and not only only retrospectives in big festivals, but we have festivals that are dedicated to uh, 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 film restoration, like Il Cinema Ritrovato in Bologna, uh, uh, um, Toute le Mémoire du Monde in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, and many more. Uh, Pordenone, Le Giornate del Cinema Muto. So we have um, uh, uh, many more occasions to see uh, uh, films restored in their original form. On the other hand, again, uh, it's a quite expensive hobby to go to these festivals. So uh, you cannot not expect, if you really want to reach people around the globe, I think you'll have to accept that uh, um, uh, yeah. the, the, another format uh, digitized. So we, what what's left to us it's really uh, educate uh, uh, so as a film historians and archivists to keep saying this is a reference copy this is not the real thing. Uh, the real thing is kept in that archive, in that format. Again, not everybody can pay uh, a trip to Amsterdam to go to the Rex Museum and see the Night Watch, but uh, everybody understands that when they see a, an image on the computer, they are not watching what Rembrandt's painted. So I think we need to, to get there. Uh, uh, um, to explain that films are a different thing. And one more thing about digital, uh, of course, uh, now there is a big revival of, uh, of uh, uh, celluloid and restoration on original uh, uh, film formats, which is great because it gives us the opportunity to tell people and educate about film technologies and so forth. But it is indeed true that new films are all born digital. Uh, um, again, back to the luxury of working in Northern Europe, we do have uh, digital workflows with, uh, within the archive archives that allow us to preserve uh, uh, new digital films in their format and uh, ha we have a, a mechanism in place for digital preservation and migration to new LTO standard to uh, um, survive the, the uh, planned uh, obsolescence of all these uh, uh, digital formats. But this is really an exception. So most, uh, um, we always cry about 70% of uh, uh, film heritage being lost in the first 35 years of cinema, um, but we'll cry as much about so many films that have been lost in the first de decade of uh, uh, born digital films. Yeah. Oh, all right, so before I go to the audience, or we go to the audience, I'd like to address one more um, topic which has been slightly touched upon already by Mayu, because maybe it, it's another dimension to the double agenda, to the, a third uh, dimension, because uh, no, matter, no matter where uh, young people see those films, either on YouTube or in a fantastic cinematic experience, uh, they might, especially when it comes to documentary films, see this as a um, historical account of what happened. So this brings me to um, film heritage as cultural memory. And uh, you already touched upon it as well, uh, um, Juana. Um, 
a vital component of historical knowledge because more and more, especially young people, tend to know what they know about history by watching films. And so this, I think, is a very important <laughs> issue which also um, relates to the question of um, decision-making and the politics of uh, selection because by selecting and by either uh, constructing a, a canon or rather not, you contribute to um, national consciousness or to um, collective memory. So how are you very um, conscious about that, um, um, Nikolai? How you, uh, how you really contribute to um, national memory and uh, constitute collective, even national identity by your selection process, uh, or uh, to put it maybe a bit more simple, <laughs> um, are you working on a canon in the Moscow Film Archive, or rather not? And why, <coughs> if so? And it's a very um, complicated question too, because you know, I know people who decide, these are film directors. When uh, documentary film directors go to documentary film archive, they already make uh, a choice. What, what will they choose for their film? So those people who construct our national, nation, national memory and national identity, these are film directors. Not uh, archivists, not film historians, not uh, teachers in the universities, but film directors. And most of them are very, very poor educated. And so <laughs> their old uh, uh, impression about national, national history, about national memory, is what they uh, produce and widespread using television or internet. Um, but it's very bad, of course, but the good idea is that was always. 10 years ago, it was uh, 20 years ago, it was 50 years ago. So it's a very usual situation. What we see on the screens of our TV, TV sets is a very wrong uh, representing uh, uh, film history and general history, which were used by very poor educated people. We never have uh, geniuses uh, on which are presented on the TV. These are usual uh, workers of the TV industry. Their uh, motto is money and time. They work very quickly. They uh, save money everywhere. They uh, put pictures from YouTube and put it to television. And state uh, put a huge amount of money to preserve films in a good condition. They uh, establish digitalization standards. They uh, produce a very special film for uh, archives and so on. But then came a film, documentary film director from television and takes a picture from YouTube and put it to television. So money which state put into preservation are not lost, of course, because we preserve these films, but we never use it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very uh, funny situation, but it is. But it's taking a, a piece of, from YouTube because it's cheaper? Or yes, because they just... He, just wants, he wants a fantastic quality of documentary filmmaker, I would say, when... Oh, you when know, it's, it's a very interesting psychological situation, too, because uh, a lot of films, which uh, uh, television takes from YouTube, made with the, um, cell phones. And people send it to YouTube, and this is a new uh, uh, visual archive of the modern history, which was uh, shot by the witnesses, by uh, the, with those people who participate in the situation they shot. It's interesting, but the quality of the picture, uh, the bad quality of the picture, became usual for the TV people, and they sometimes even don't understand that the quality must be better. So it's just a habit to take picture from uh, accessible resources. And we cannot, we, film historians, we, film um, uh, teachers, we cannot change the situation. It's impossible. I, because I you think, addressed it already yeah. a little but, bit. But I think Juana. it's a very complex question, Sonia, because um, the problem of the nation, defining the nation, what is the nation, will be like basic to what the archive is representing. And in the case of Latin America, we come from this agitated historical circumstance in which I think that, of course, every single archive that is getting little or a lot money from the state or from uh, mixed funds, like in the case of Colombia, they have YouTube channels or they have their own video-on-demand platforms attached to their websites, 
And I think it's praiseable what they are doing, what they are rescuing, either if it is mainstream. But at the same time, um, I mean, I can bring two examples. In Chile, the NYU program that goes abroad with um, student, students of the MIA program, we work at the Señal 3 La Victoria TV channel, which is a TV channel that was born in the outskirts of Santiago. Um, it's a community that seriously resisted Pinochet and created their, their own TV station, and they had a lot of support from a filmmaker, documentary maker, Pablo Salas, and Pablo Salas was working for the RAI, for the Italian TV at the time, so he had a lot of protection, and he helped training people a lot in magnetic media. Um, we were able to contribute and to exchange knowledge and to give them a very basic transfer, transfer unit. That's a very residual archive that is very important because there is, a mem there is, there is um, documentary footage about Allende, about resistance to Pinochet. There is, of course, official footage from Pinochet government. But this is a very important archive that people do not know. So we're talking about the residual nation. And I'll give you a second example that I just want to... I just want to bring to the table how problematic that is. Tele Antioquia, which is the most important TV news source in Medellin, uh, the, the, the Pablo Escobar name seems new to a lot of people because of the Narcos series in Netflix. And the way this person, who is really a very psychological character, and no TV series, no film that has embarked on Escobar has ever dig into his psychology. It's all the idea of easy money, drug dealing, sensationalistic, all made for a spectacle, etc. But Tele Antioquia decided to discard every single archive that had to do with Pablo Escobar because it was bad image for the region. And so we are leaving to... Uh, global institutions or commercial chains such as Netflix, yeah. the task of building the memory, because a lot of young people think that that's Pablo Escobar and think that, that everything that is so humorous about the TV series is how my generation experienced Pablo Escobar, and it's not true. Those were dreadful years, and many left the country because we saw no future. We didn't see it as a joke at the time. So it's the problem of the decisions that the nation also makes. No, uh, of course, uh, I, I don't mean whatsoever uh, nation in an essentialist yeah. way, not at all. I was just referring to the idea of film as, as a component of historical knowledge, and when you keep for instance, um, uh, preserving and presenting certain kind of films, you may impact upon how people uh, not only think about film history, but also about history in general. That was my, my, uh, that was my, that's the background of my question. But I see, because of the political situation, there's no such thing as, yeah. as working on a canon in Latin America. I think that ch the challenge for state institutions that handle archives uh, is really how to create a memory yeah. that is more inclusive, that can face terror, that can face trauma, and make it less show and tell. Mm -hmm. Because most of the things that you see in the official websites or film archives in Latin America is pretty much show and tell of the nation. Yeah. And I think the real challenge for the archive, because archives are about memory, mm -hmm. is confronting the traumatic memories of the nation. Yeah. Understandable, yes. Uh, now, from, from a Dutch perspective and my personal experience, I was uh, very lucky to start working at the Film Museum uh, um, in the 90s, where uh, the late uh, Horst Blotkamp was the director, and first Eric de Kuyper, and then uh, Peter Del Peut, both uh, uh, writers and filmmakers, uh, were artistic directors. And their uh, approach to the selection and restoration of the collection was very much driven by um, a, a goal of rewriting uh, film history, specifically for them was uh, uh, silent film history. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, that has been not, uh, was not happening only there, it was happening really in many archives, in research, and uh, um, it did uh, indeed add the whole uh, silent period to 
canonical film history. Before that, of course, there were uh, researches done, but not massive uh, preservation uh, 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 programs. Uh, and now uh, uh, silent films is a, a, a topic uh, uh, in itself uh, in many uh, um, at, um, uh, university programs, uh, research programs, and, and at many festivals. So I think what, uh, what uh, um, Eric Decay and Peter Del Pote did for the for uh, uh, the film museum at the time and had a big influence on on many uh, archives worldwide was really to focus on uh, uh, what has been forgotten in the collection and again it has also to do probably with Dutch uh, film heritage a film heritage that it's important but relatively small it's not uh, the French cinema it's not German cinema and it's a country of uh, 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 of course uh, uh, um, um, in its positive way, a country of encounters, a country of many, many uh, cultural uh, uh, cultures meeting. So in that sense, uh, um, uh, um, even today, there is a lot of, uh, in the way uh, uh, we work at the IFI Museum, there is a lot, the sense of scouting in the collection and outside in terms of acquisition. And so things that are not uh, cannot be looked up in the uh, history books and discover things that are for forgotten. Well, there are things that are long forgotten and have disappeared, so there is no way of rewriting history with those, but at least those that are just forgotten in the vaults or in someone's attics mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm. or uh, um, under the beds, as often happens with filmmakers, uh, uh, there is a chance uh, to uh, rediscover those. I don't know if this answers a little yes, bit. Yes, I understand. Um, all right, with a few to um, time, it's a bit dark in the, in the, in the room, but um, is there... I can't see you, but anyway. Um, it's, if you have a question, please speak loud. And, uh, Hello. And, and you can either address it to, um, to one of, of the three or to all three of them. Um, I guess mine's just sort of to everyone. Um, just thinking about um, archives, I guess, as, as cultural memory or a way of kind of shaping people's ideas about themselves and their history. And I was just wondering to what extent um, the archives that you guys deal with work collaboratively or internationally with other archives because um, I'm just thinking in the I work in Kenya and I know that they don't um, their archive is sort of disappearing um, and there's this sense that kind of young people in Kenya when they maybe look back to their history and images of themselves um, if for example um, archives in Britain or other Western countries are preserving the films that were created in those countries by their own filmmakers uh, the images that these young people are going to see are going to be images that were created by by other people. So I'm just wondering to what extent your archives kind of help other archives internationally might not necessarily have enough resources um, in preserving those images to keep that kind of diversity in images. Yeah, I think that's very complicated. For I mean, for example... Um, in the case of Latin America helping other countries because the archives are precisely in the position of requesting support from other archives. Um, so that's one difficulty. The, the other thing is that of course, speaking in this forum, I have like a double position because I work also for a country that although it has difficulties, it does have a lot of resources uh, in, and it leads um, in a lot of the regulations and standards and discussions and conversations that are brought to the table in preservation through the Library of Congress, through, in a way, being the main headquarters of AMIA, the Association of Moving Image Archivists, um, and so on. And also, I think that the universities, for example, have very good resources, the museums, we have the MoMA archive, etc. I think that the, the, in NYU we do something called APEX, um, Archival Preservation Exchange. And I'm sorry because Joanne is one of the persons that have heard this more than one time. And I think it's important on how people use connectivity and how people use 
uh, networking to make it meaningful and to make it productive. And one of the things that the Archival Preservation Exchange does, uh, which is a trip that we take with the students at the end of the school year, and is by volunteering. We don't pay the students, the students don't pay a fee. We get uh, um, support from the Film Foundation, from the dean in the university, from the dean of Tisch. Um, but one of the premises has been to eradicate a little bit the vertical model of support from big countries, such as um, the Peace Corps or Alliance for Progress or Borders Without Doctors, which are pro programs that did wonderful things, but also were based on a very colonial power that this is the white person bringing the knowledge to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, but better create a horizontal uh, model where we exchange. That's why it's not a training model. We in Argentina learn a lot about nitrate uh, because they are really behind and they have a problem. And actually, Fernando Madedo's um, resigned to directing the Sinaí. The 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 it was a cinematic in the making because there was an issue with uh, his pushing for safety in handling nitrate in Argentina, and also another issue with the Solana's documentary restoration, the hour of the furnaces. So I think that that collaboration is important, um, creating ways in which, in which we exchange the digital humanities project that I am working on right now, which is called Arturita.net, uh, is intended to provide resources and an exchange virtual basis for archivists in Latin America. But I think that that's something that can be replicated in Asia, in Africa, in the border or something. So I think that we also, for me, the most practical answer to your question is that we have to educate ourselves. And if we are in the filmmaking business, in the industry, in documentary makers, um, we have to get the curiosity and learn how to preserve our own stuff, mm -hmm. teach communities how to do the things, and really um, not expect for the things to happen, but make the things happen. Um, that's, that's a model of solution. Mm -hmm. Doesn't curate everything, doesn't heal everything, but it's a contribution. Mm -hmm. You don't, you, you, do you get any support from this um, um, organization that you mentioned before, FIAF? This is the World um, Federal um, Association of Film Archives, or you don't need it because, you know... Uh, no, we need, I mean, we would love for Apex to grow a little bit uh, more and to become self-sustainable. We don't, we don't get any support from them. Um, actually, I think that that's one of the things that has to change in FIAF, how training for Latin America, Asia, and Africa is decided. Yeah. yeah, and how people are selected to participate in the few workshops that they give and also the subjects. I do think, for example, and I want to emphasize that um, training people in community archiving is very important these days. And that has to be analog and that has to be digital. Mm -hmm. Learning from how to organize your phone, mm -hmm. your computer, these people that are digital hoarders and have like 100 files on the desktop, that's very dangerous when you are a filmmaker. No. Uh, organizing, organizing your assets, the ones of your family, the ones of your community, because that's how memory grows. Family, region, society, nation. No. So I think that there's, there's really a need to change. It cannot be over and over on film handling. Yeah. No. I also mean in terms of when we, uh, or when we speak about world cinema, uh -huh. it might be you know, a, a dominance of uh, cinema and documentaries from more advanced countries, like the Netherlands mm -hmm. or maybe even Russia, uh, to the disadvantage of Latin American documentaries. Yeah. Yes, but you wanted to... Uh, uh, no, I, yeah, just a, a couple of examples of uh, international collaboration. Um, and I, um, there are definitely collaborations uh, uh, at the level uh, of uh, um, um, 
working together on uh, recovering and uh, restoring uh, collections or, uh, uh, or, or a single title. Um, there are, um, and this is mainly through the uh, channels of the International Federation of Film Archive, FIAF, which is a very, a quite selective club of archives. Mm -hmm. So, but but it is uh, uh, worldwide, so in that sense uh, um, allows collaboration among countries richer and poorer to a certain level. Uh, also FIAF encourages this or uh, organizes this uh, uh, a few workshops, which are probably not ideal, but still a means of uh, knowledge exchange. As I speak, one of my colleagues is spending a week in Calcutta uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, his yeah. knowledge um, about, about our daily work. Of course, I completely agree in that sense that the format must be all about exchanging knowledge and making it um, uh, useful for the situation uh, the local situation, uh, rather than lecturing about how good we are here with a lot of money uh, to spend, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, we can always use more, of course. Um, um, and finally, I think, and in that sense, uh, um, the Association of Moving Image Archive, AMIA, is a fantastic uh, platform for that. Uh, an exchange of knowledge and a platform for creating collaborations that it's not institutional, that is individual based, and where all collections are alike. So we're really, uh, and in that sense, uh, I'm uh, a member for many years and a big uh, a fan of the um, of Amia. But uh, my big point of criticism with that association is that it focuses very much on uh, North American membership, whereas I think there is a room and and uh, need for something that is more global than that. I would like to add something to that, and is that the membership for these congresses by places like AMIA, and many times things like ITFA, and in general, is is unaffordable for a very for many Latin American countries. I mean, think of Cuba, for example, or think of the conditions that Venezuela is going through. So, for example, going to AMIA, where the registration is $395, the hotel is $150 the night, mm -hmm. the plane ticket is uh, $700 from any country in Latin America to the States. Uh, that's like five years of work yeah. of a whole family to attend a conference on archives. So that's one of the things that associations really have to reconsider how much they are charging Latin American people. I, I do think that the model of the Cineteca de Bologna, um, the summer school that is trying to increase the scholarships for people from Latin America, Asia, and Africa to participate is a good one because those are the countries that really do not have the benefits that Northern European countries have, or countries like the States, or rich Asian countries like Japan and Korea. Thank you, Juana. Any more questions from the audience? Please. <laughs> no particular questions for none of, of the guests? All right, then um, I have been working with um, archives, television archives myself at the European level, I have to, to say, very much, and I'm still doing. And um, in that context, I also uh, like to read some about something about archival theory because I think that media studies uh, increasingly needs archival theory to reflect upon heritage and the meaning of heritage. And in that, um, when I was reading archival theory, I came across Terry Cook, maybe uh, some of you know him, and he puts it this way. Um, we could, yes, um, he says, probably it's like this, we keep what we are and vice versa, we are what we keep. And I've been thinking about this phrasing. So um, we keep what we are, and vice versa, we are what we keep. And I interpret, but I'm, uh, because I see you thinking, um, 
uh, I thought about uh, I thought about it in um, in the context of television archives, European television archives, and I thought maybe he means that how biased selections are. We talked to, about selections from very different perspectives. There is an implicit or maybe even unconscious process of uh, reproducing identities that we are most comfortable with, which may lead to more institutionalized visions of the past. Um, and it may be indeed increasingly important to have these other voices um, through community archives or stories from people like Europeana is, is now organizing around the uh, topic of migration. So there are institutionalized of course, accounts, visual accounts of migration, but there are also stories from people, personal stories, diaries, etc. But again, back to this, we keep what we are and vice versa, we are what we keep. What do you think, Nikolai? Well, I'm, I like him theory, you know, but uh, I'm not sure that he can add something valuable <laughs> to your ideas. It's uh, usually out of my Is interest. True, in your yeah. Sense. Uh, <laughs> Your yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I can agree, okay. of course. But uh, what else? I don't know. Maybe uh, it should be better to be silent. <laughs> you know, I, I can't answer uh, uh, equally this question. I have to think before. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No. Uh, I think it's. Uh, um, uh, it's. <laughs> I think it's true, uh, partly, or for a gr great deal. And I think uh, if we go back to what we were discussing earlier about uh, national heritage, and etc., it is uh, implicit in uh, uh, many national film archives that we keep what we have invested in. So... Yeah. Uh, we so there is a even before the archives uh, uh, can make any choices there have been choices about what films we invest in and make possible to make and so probably uh, that uh, we could even change that uh, slogan for a film production it, it definitely in uh, uh, in uh, uh, the in the European industry where there is a lot of uh, of uh, public funding in film production uh, that said, um, an, a, a recent example in archival uh, world, which I like because it is um, um, slightly playing with that, both with the concept of nationalism, but also with the concept of we are what we keep, uh, um, um, the Ottoman project. It's a project that has been uh, um, started a few years back by a number of archivists and uh, film historians worldwide. Uh, my dear colleague Elif Rongen Kainakchi, she is the curator of silent films at uh, I Film Museum, is one of the promoters of this project. And it is really um, uh, fighting, I mean, it's going across institutional uh, uh, collections. It's looking for Ottoman cinema. Ottoman cinema uh, doesn't exist. Ottoman Empire uh, disappeared when, uh, um, when, uh, when cinema was just starting. But there are a few years of Ottoman cinema. And Ottoman cinema can be a, a much broader concept than only films that were produced during the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, I just like to name that as something, um, a new way of approaching um, uh, trans institutionals, trans nationals collection, and kind of also rewriting identities. I mean, I'm sure there are many more projects in that sense, but maybe food for thought. Would you like to respond to this um, yeah, I think phrasing? That, I think that that's, um, that can be taken as a premise if we also consider that we are what we don't know about, our, about ourselves, about our archives. Yeah. So we are those archives that we have been unable to see because of the backlog in analog preservation and because the backlog in digital uh, in digitization digital preservation and also because many of our archives are in the diaspora now arsenal here in berlin has a big collection of um, latin american films a student of nyu who made his thesis on chilean documentaries in exile 
Many people know that most of those exiles happened in the diaspora and they were spread out in Canada. There was, there is a big film archive spread in mm -hmm. um, film institutions in Sweden because there was a big diaspora of Chilean people to Sweden. Um, Albertina Carri in the documentary of in Los Cuatreros, um, she, because her parents were disappeared, she has some takes of the Icaic in Cuba and she, the question that is over those images is how come the Icaic is not declared world film heritage? There's a lot of revolutionary memory that was put in consignment, in deposit in the Icaic and that's an archive with very serious issues. Is Cuba is the tropic they don't have humidifiers, they don't have um, a lot of temperature control and other things that are very important in an archive. Uh, but we all know that each country in Latin America during the 60s, the 70s and the 80s sent materials to Cuba to be protected so that they were not going to be destroying our countries. Yeah. So yes, we are what we keep, but we are also what we don't know about ourselves. Yeah. Hidden collections. Yeah, that's a very uh, nice final phrasing. I'm afraid we have to uh, stop um, here. Um, thank you very much, Giovanna, uh, Juana, thank and you. Nikolai, for thank you, thank you for for um, discussing this with us. And I think it's very important, especially in this Dutch context, to have uh, visions and voices from other archives, from other corners of the world, because it's indeed. I think we we should. Uh, work towards a de-westernized approach of archiving and also archiving theory, maybe, in the end. And this helped very much. So I'm, um, I'm very happy you, uh, you made it to, uh, to ITFA and to this uh, debate. So there, we have been discussing a few things that are on the agenda for next year, I'm afraid, <laughs> like um, engaging young audiences with um, film heritage and also the, um, the issue of community archives as a way of um, nuancing and modifying institutionalized visions of the past. So hope to see you all next year again here. Thank and you so much. Thank you. Thank you.